Welcome to Dream Makers, candid conversations with women that will change the way that you see success, purpose, and what it takes to bridge the two. I'm Neha Sampat, a three-time tech founder and CEO with a focus on companies that are places to dream big, be a good human, build up. I'm CEO of Content Stack and also a certified sommelier. So yes, we do drink wine here from time to time. I'm joined by Danielle Kahn, VP of Startup Engagement and Head of Lift Labs at Comcast. She directs Comcast's work with startups, incubators, co-working spaces, investors, and entrepreneurs, as well as programs that inspire current and potential Comcast and NBC Universal talent. Today, we're going to talk about being a connector, creating a symphony of innovation within organizations, and the art and science of cross-company collaboration. Let's get started. Hi, Danielle. Hi, Neha. So thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. And I'm happy to be here with you. I'm so happy to be here. I know it took us a while to schedule this and people have said such great things about you. So I can't wait to have this conversation and learn more about your world. You've been connected to the startup world from your very early professional days when you were at a Philadelphia ad agency helping, the, helping launch startups. Tell us a little bit more about that and how did you uncover your love for startups and, and why are you so drawn to them? Yeah, I, I really fell into it. I, I don't know that I, I started a career meaning to do that, but one of my very first jobs was at an ad agency in Philadelphia. They had just opened up a PR department and I was their employee number two in that department. Um, and we helped to launch some, what became really big, big brands like And One Basketball Shoes and Apparel, Smart Bowl Socks, Bucks County Coffee, which uh, eventually became uh, Saxby's Coffee. And there, it, it was like such a wonderful time to help support entrepreneurs going from maybe one or two founders to very big companies <laughs> very quickly. And I always you know, worked on the teams who were writing the very first press releases and content for these companies the very first press releases for some of these companies. And then we would put them out and all of a sudden their sales would soar. And, uh, and then the marketing and advertising that would complement that. And it, it, was, it was fantastic. And working in an ad agency is like working in a startup. <laughs> so you really get to work on absolutely every part of a business and um, get to know founders in a, in a way that uh, is very inspiring. So I remember working with the founders of and one, and they were, you know, five guys selling trash talk t-shirts out of the trunk of a car at University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> and, you know, to watch that company grow into what it, what it did was really phenomenal. So I've always been a startup storyteller, a champion of startups. Many of my friends uh, built businesses and it's, it's just always been there. There's, there's something that draws certain people and certain personalities to that. And, and it sounds like you've been at the foundation of that m multiple times over, and being on the agency side, you get to do that a lot. I actually started my early career also in PR and transitioned to run my own PR agency. And it was always so gratifying to be to write the first press release or deliver the first press conference and and then watching what happens as as that continue the company continues to soar and go down the journey from startup to a scaling company. Just yeah. And then eventually you start looking at it and thinking, oh wait, I can do that. I can actually build that. I don't really just only need to be the communications around it, but I can have the, the idea, the product, build the team. And uh, yeah. that pivoting from marketing communications about 10 years ago into this industry, into more of like tech startup industry was transformational, but it definitely had all of the root of marketing communications. And I still use that every day. I absolutely, um, that resonates with me a lot because I, I kind of went through a similar journey and having spent a lot of time with product managers and product marketers and feeling like I was actually contributing and helping them to build out their stories and then realizing I really just wanted to be on the other side. And that's how I became a product <laughs> person as well. So um, sounds like we have some parallels there. I um, we do we do taste wine and on Dream Makers, so I have shipped you a bottle of the Riesling Cabinet. Yes, thank uh, you with, so much. And I've got one here with me. And what I like about this wine, I kind of consider it the wine for non-wine drinkers to a certain extent because it's really Which light. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not a wine drinker, so yes, and, and so yeah, I was made aware of that, so I wanted to <laughs> share something that I thought would be 
just super light and approachable fun. I know it's not, and it's not very heavy. And if you just have one or two sips, it's still um, hopefully something that's um, pleasant. Yeah. So Tuesday. cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Um, it's got a little bit that of is, to that it. That is really very um, <laughs> sweet, light. Mm, it's perfect for summer. It is. It's a nice summer wine. And typically what you get in a Riesling, there, there's like a class of Riesling that has this like almost like petrol like essence. And then you've got the class mm. that's a little bit more off dry or almost a little bit sweet that has mm -hmm. a little bit of honey and apricot and stone fruit. And that's what this one is. That's so. what I taste. I almost taste a little bit of lavender in it. Is that yeah. possible? Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I like to me, the honey comes across, especially mm -hmm. as it gets on your palate for a little while. Yeah. Delicious. So thank you. Moving away from wine and into learning more about you. So tell us about kind of the startup bug. You talked about it a lot, but you also founded a company called Hospitality. Tell, tell us about what sparked that idea and what that journey was like. Sure. Yeah, I've actually founded two companies. One was hospitality, um, and it was really a result of my mom. My mom was in the hospital, and it was in the Philadelphia area. And she was in the hospital for several days, and her nurse happened to be my very good friend from childhood. And during that time, I would call up my friend Liz and say, hey, can you bring my mom this or that or drop off this or that? Um, and at the time, you know, could you call her? I can't find her. Can you call her? And so it was almost as if Liz was her or my concierge to my mother and keeping found, like keeping us connected. And at the end of that experience, my mom said, this was the best experience I've ever had in the hospital. And unfortunately, my mother has spent time in hospital over the years. Um, and she said, gosh, everybody should have a Liz. And, uh, I think what was so special about it was it felt very personal, right? But it was it was really about the calming of the patient and the family and the connection and keeping communication going. And um, at the time, I was head of marketing communications for the Philadelphia Convention Visitors Bureau. That was my day job. Um, and working in travel and tourism and hospitality, I would stay in hotels all over the world and experience in-room hospitality through your television screen. And I remember saying to Liz, you know, we should map this out and figure out how do I scale Liz into a business? <laughs> and on, you know, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday nights, we would get together and we would map out what Liz in technology might look like. And we built out hospitality and it was the idea of like hospital ITY was, was actually the brand name. And we developed the product. We had a technology partner involved with us. And um, we were starting to talk to a lot of hospitals in the Philadelphia area. Philadelphia is a really, obviously, very robust uh, place for you know, learning about healthcare and having access to so many different mm -hmm. people in the community. And during that time, uh, we pitched Penn, Temple, Jefferson, every hospital. And they, you know, our, our concept ultimately, and that, that we had a proof of concept, we had an MVP built. And we said, okay, how do you integrate something like this into all of the different healthcare technologies that exist? It was extremely complicated. Um, as you very well know, I'm sure, you know, the healthcare industry today is probably a lot easier than it was then to not just build a business, but to get access to some of the central technologies that are leveraged for hospital systems, especially patient communication. And so during the time um, we, you know, had lined up basically small pilots with a lot of hospitals. And then um, we both went through personal issues. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we both actually got divorced at this you know, similar times. And at the time we decided like, we're gonna table this and focus more on having roles in organizations. Um, and so we put it on the shelf um, and it still sits on a shelf. And every <laughs> once in a while, I keep looking for this thing that exists in the hospital system and it still does not exist. And in fact, during COVID, it was so, it was kind of sad to me that 
our technology still didn't exist, um, that people haven't put the patient and their family first. And that's why nurses and doctors are still holding up their phones and mostly nurses. You know, the, the goal of this was scaling Liz. She was a nurse. Right. And she was spending a ton of time on very EQ type of services for, cus for the, her customer, right? The patient, the family. And, um, and that's, you know, again, why during, during uh, the pandemic, we still had people not being able to access their families when they needed it most. And it was very, I thought it was very sad to watch. Um, yeah, so we're lovely. definitely seeing more and more of this come to life now. And I'm hopeful, but it's kind of funny full circle. Um, so being at Comcast NBCU, we do have a connected health team. There's a joint venture that we have with Independence Blue Cross. Part of the reason why I ended up um, talking to Comcast in depth more about eight, nine years ago was they were starting to build out that idea. And I met them um, through a mutual investor friend that we have in Philadelphia. And a lot of what they're building now is a lot of what we were dreaming up in hospitality. Um, so it's great to see it come to life in, in Comcast. And there's still just so much more to do from a care technology, caregiving, mm -hmm. age technology space, and that is, I think, what still is one of the biggest innovation opportunities that very much excites me. I, I couldn't agree more. And just in general, health technology and fitness technology is, is getting a lot of attention and traction. And hopefully we'll start to see the fruits of all these ideas, like starting to finally culminate into something yeah. usable by patients and easy. I have a friend who's here in Austin also building out kind of a, a Liz, but with an AI tilt, mm -hmm. trying to help automate a lot of um, understanding patients' needs, especially um, when it comes to like end of life care and, and some of the more um, difficult challenges for families and the support that they need. So I'd so, love yeah. to meet her. Um, and I have, it's, it's also really interesting. So in the last, during COVID, um, my father passed away about now, it'll be July 11th, it'll be two years. Um, and during that time, thank you. During that time, um, my parents had moved into a retirement community and, you know, lockdown happened. Um, we couldn't get in to see them, but my sister and I would go and visit and stand outside and dance and stuff like that. We did everything we could. And then when my dad was at end of life, uh, I decided that I would just hide out in the retirement community. So I snuck in and lived there for four days. And I basically got a full head of what life is like in a retirement community and created a whole punch list of the challenges that I certainly don't want you or I to have to face in whatever number, you know, 50 years um, that, you know, hopefully things will get, will will get even more patient and family cent centered, right? So what was interesting though, is during that time, I happened to tell a the story of end of life with my father to someone. And they said, oh, um, Melinda Gates's group, the holding and in partnership with Pivotal Ventures, her investment arm and the holding co are working on, they were just starting out on a project, a really big research project called Invest in Care. And I was asked to be a part of that working group, which was this incredible working group that met virtually uh, you know, during COVID and help to develop and inform this incredible research around the half a trillion dollar uh, care tech and caregiving uh, ecosystem. And it's on its the website is investing.care. If you're not familiar with it, definitely oh, check it out. Yeah. Um, and so through that, I was asked to, to do that actually because of my experience of being in the retirement community for four days, it wasn't necessarily for my what I do for a living. Um, but I got to meet so many wonderful people who are just like your friend, um, you know, working on amazing solutions for patients and families. And so we're now doing more and more work like that with some of those partners um, to, to really help try to solve problems and, and frankly, like help democratize some of the, the care that exists yeah. and make it really accessible. Through all of the, the sadness and everything that happened during COVID for everyone's family, everyone went through so many different things. 
it's um, every now and then you get a little bit of the, the silver lining where something good will come yeah. out of the experiences that we all had. Um, okay, so let me switch a little bit to you know, another, another kind of um, area of focus for you. It seems that you've learned to stay close to new technologies as, after hospitality. You became sort of an Uber connector in Philly and started bridging startup and corporate worlds. What were you doing there? You know, how did you do that? And then, you know, why is it important for these two worlds to come together? It's a great question. So um, during the time that I was building hospitality, I kind of jumped into the Philadelphia startup ecosystem. And at the time we had a mayor, um, Mayor Michael Nutter, who was really interested in startup cities. And as a city, we were looking at how, what can we learn from other cities? And I was actually an executive on loan to him for the first two years of his administration. And part of that work, I ended up working on the first seed fund that Philadelphia had for startups. And we developed that by doing a lot of best practices, tours and meeting with people around the country, around the world. Um, who were doing this work already and basically borrowing from the best of the best and bringing those things back to my hometown of Philadelphia and where Comcast is headquartered. And a little tidbit, my mother actually worked on the same floor as our founder, Ralph Roberts, when Comcast was a startup. Wow. <laughs> so I have literally seen this company grow up in front of my eyes from startup to, you know, we now have hundreds of thousands of employees around the globe. Um, and two amazing headquarter buildings in Philadelphia. And I get to run a space within the Comcast Technology Center. It's, it's very full circle for me personally. So cool. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. And the founder um, passed away. His son actually now is our CEO, Brian. Um, their son, Tucker, um, is also involved in Leeds Gaming um, for Spectre Gaming, Spectre Core Gaming. Um, so we work really closely. And there, it, it is, uh, it's, it's really amazing to watch, but so to, to sort of answer your question, I just dove in. This this was never this was never my job. I actually never thought this would become my job. I thought it was part of my other role in travel tourism marketing communications that in order to attract conventions, meetings, tourists to Philadelphia, that we needed to think about innovation stories. And so I just started telling naturally like innovation stories of entrepreneurs in our backyard as part of our tourism story. And then I got to know a lot of the entrepreneurs who were building these amazing companies in old city mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and got, you know, was asked by an incoming president for Philly startup leaders to lead communications and get involved there. And that's what kind of did it. <laughs> And then I spent, I just volunteered a lot of time and showed up uh, and, and volunteer, you know, just spent a lot of my free time doing this work. It was a passion. And through that work, started to make connections from the startups I would meet, having met a lot of people from Comcast over the years and seeing the opportunity to do pilots and proofs of concept and try things. Uh, I knew that there was a bridge to be built that um, that was a win-win, right? So that is essentially, uh, it. I, I, I've been told that not everybody could do that <laughs> to talk corporate and startup, yeah. um, to have a little bit of both of those things, but coming from the community and being a part of the community and frankly, all of the programs that we've built, we built with the community. We asked the community, we're, we definitely were not top down on this. We were very much bottom up on going around for the first almost two years of our program development. We interviewed 1500 founders from around the world, across the country. We met with them, we showed up, we asked them, you know, in addition to funding, what else can we do to really support you? And that's how we developed all of our programs. It's all, and, it all comes from yeah. like your, your natural ability to connect with people, really, if you think about like, I mean, it's a connector's world, being able to figure out what people need, bring that to them. And, yeah. um, and I, you know, I think I, I consider myself a connector as well. So I'm kind of yeah. curious, like, what do you, you know, what, what are some ideas or ways that you could encourage people to make connections and how would they use them? Like, you know, do you have some, some thoughts for our listeners on that? 
Absolutely. And it's interesting because now that folks are going back to the offices, some are, some are not, um, uh, you know, we've now been back in the office somewhat uh, a few days a week and just the reconnections with people inside our uh, company has been incredible. So uh, number one, I think right now, given the moment that we're in, get out, <laughs> go back to talking to people in person. I know that people are really comfortable at home. You know, I think we all would love to continue to maybe work in PJs and, um, and I'm not saying that by any means we should be doing that, you know, be in an office five days a week by any means, but I think getting out and reconnecting with communities and with your coworkers and your collab, your potential collaborators is how I've always seen connections is showing up when you're, when you're there, when you're in the room, someone will turn to you and say, Neha, like, you know, Hey, I have this project. What do you think of it? Do you want to work on it with me? And it's just like, you keep showing up. Yeah. And for, for me too, as a woman, and I know that like a large, a large part of what you talk about here too, um, I never thought about not going to places because it was only men. In fact, that was almost more of a reason why I would show up. And most of the, the people that helped me um, in my early days, they were men. They were bringing me to the table. And so you have to show up, you have to keep showing up and then keep bringing new people with you. And, uh, and I think the other piece of it for connection for me is like show up in rooms where people don't expect you to show up, right? And bring in people who don't look like you or from a totally different background. The conversation, the outcomes are so much more interesting. <laughs> and the audience and the potential of reaching a much wider customer base is there's that much more potential. And uh, you just learn so much about yourself uh, in, in those interactions. And so, I don't know, I get jazzed about those, those interactions. I know not everybody does. I know not everybody is an extrovert. And in fact, during COVID, I've learned I'm more of an introvert than I ever thought. Um, but the, the idea of showing up and being present is something that we hear from our community of startups all the time that yeah. we're, you know, we are, our team is the real deal. We show up when you need us. When we ask, when they ask for an intro, we make it. We will do our best to support support companies, um, whether we're investing in them or not, whether we're working with them or not. Um, so it, it is, and, and I end up hiring people who have that DNA and it's, building a team that is incredibly diverse, who people relate to, yeah, no matter right. where they're from. It's such great advice. And showing up is, is half the battle most of the time. And I love the idea of showing up in a room where you're not expected and bringing others along with you because that's how you change the game. And that's how we start to level the playing field that has typically weighed one in one direction. This is how we start to influence the conversation to change and become more diverse and become more interesting. And hopefully that means everybody that's present learns something. <laughs> you know, and especially women, um, this is something I've definitely seen seen changing, but not fast, still not fast enough. Um, I think it's just so important that we're realizing that just because I'm a woman sitting at a table doesn't mean I'm going to lose my seat at that table. In fact, what I need to do is just keep pulling three more chairs up every time for three new people who can join me. And at the right time, I don't need to be at that table and someone else can be there instead of me. What may be. But, you know, I, I think in the past there has been among some women a uh, feeling that if I, if I'm there, that means like if I'm, if I'm there, if I bring somebody else, I'm going to lose my seat. And I just think that that's, that is incorrect. And we have such an opportunity to rally as women and yeah. just, you know, and support each other and keep one amplifying another. each other, yeah. you know? Yeah. So one thing I love about um, com at Comcast and Lift Labs in particular is that is the word lift. <laughs> it really should be about lifting each other up. So let's let's dive deeper into your work um, overseeing startup engagement at Comcast. Why why do you think it was so important for Comcast to build this function? You've talked a lot about the importance of Comcast in the community and and supporting the community and and helping the community to thrive. Tell us a little bit more about that, the ecosystem, the insights of all the founders. I think there's 1,500 founders across the world that are engaged. Tell us a little bit more. 
Yeah. So we, we basically are, our three core goals in doing this work are really around finding new product innovation that can help our company and help our customers and help our employees, first and foremost. Um, the second is to engage in communities and to support communities so that new ideas are coming from a really inclusive community of founders. And you already know the stats, but they're pathetic still in women and people of color founding companies and getting funded. Um, and our, you know, we're certainly not perfect, but about 60% of our companies are founded by women or people of color. Oh, wow. That's astounding and awesome. Yeah. 40% are women. So it is possible if you build a strong pipeline mm -hmm. and it exists it's not that it doesn't exist, which is a fallacy. Um, the pipeline's there. You have to go show up in new places and talk to new people to find a new network, a broader network. And, and you really have to create a rubric around how you decide on which companies to partner with and invest in, right? So that's like the second piece. And the third piece was really interesting to me because I don't know that when I first took this role, was it top of mind, but entrepreneurship, creating um, a, a safe place for people to feel like they can innovate every day in everything they do and to inspire people to look around the corner to challenge the status quo. And so we get a lot of employees who come to our events who want to be inspired, who want to stay inspired. And I mean, this is at every level of the organization mm -hmm. from C-suite to college students um, who just came out, you know, of, of school. It is really amazing. And people uh, are, they think about their jobs in different ways. They think about what they're building in different ways. And so that third piece to me was, I, I don't know that I realized what a big need it was. Um, and, and it, they all feed each other. Yes. Each one of those goals is, is connected. Um, you know, as you build community, you build that stronger pipeline of product innovation. The product innovation then can impact the employees mm -hmm. in their innovation that they build by or partner with. And then it makes them think about things in a totally different way. And that becomes incredibly secular where um, all of a sudden we've got mentors working with startups and they're thinking maybe at the beginning, I'm going to I'm going to teach this startup X. And then by the end, they're like, I learned X from this startup and it's, have lifelong uh, co-mentoring. It's just incredible. It's so that, that, whole, that whole ecosystem and by doing all of those things and showing up in community and then showing up internally and getting the buy-in from the very beginning from business leaders across our entire company. Uh, Comcast, NBC, Universal, Universal Pictures, Parks, um, Sky that's, that's overseas. You know, we have so many incredible brands that we can pull together mentors and there's a lot of co-learning there. And each one of those mentors is a part of our process. They're sending us companies to take a look at. They are screening with us. What's a real interest? What would they try in the next quarter uh, to do a pilot with? You know, so almost always there has to be not almost always, but always we have to have some kind of a, a champion, a business champion, who says, "Oh, there's something really interesting in that company that we found. We're going to work with them in the next accelerator or in the next liftoff challenge." Um, and they commit to doing that. So we, we really do this in a very cross-company collaborative innovation style. Um, our core programs, we do a lot of inspirational talks and um, ideation and um, you know, author talks, and that's under the name of Live at Lyft. And we have two accelerators. One is Lift Labs, one is Sports Tech. Lift Labs is focused on media entertainment and connectivity companies. Mm -hmm. Sports Tech is on eight different verticals in sports. And 
Um, for sports tech, we have a lot of external partners that are engaged in that, like NASCAR, USD and Snow, um, NBC Sports, and the list goes on, um, who are not part of our company, but are we do a lot of work with these with these big brands. Um, and then the third component that we started, because uh, actually through a lot of our research that we did initially in going to London and Tel Aviv and Tel Aviv in particular, um, their accelerator models are very different. So their accelerator models are not a 12 week equity mm -hmm. investment kind of piece up front it is much more about business development for enterprise ready companies. So we developed a third program called Liftoff and Liftoff is really about working with a business leader to develop what is that specific business challenge that is keeping you up at night that you're not doing right now, but is really critical. And we map out, we do a, we do a quick, you know, all of this happens within a three month period. We uh, develop a statement, a challenge out to the startup ecosystem. The startups then respond. We have a, um, you know, a screening panel for that. But these are all enterprise ready companies who are pitching us on how they would solve that specific challenge. And then the, you know, quote winner gets a paid proof of concept, which ultimately leads to, leads to hopefully a pilot Marshall deal. We've had a lot of great success um, in that. Um, and I, I get to work with an amazing team. Well, I'm employee, like I was employee number one. We have a small but mighty team of incredibly diverse people who have great skills and run all of the stuff that I've just talked about. <laughs> and uh, we scout companies from around the world and they get to work with some of the biggest really amazing cool. media brands under Comcast, NBC, and Sky. It's a win-win. It's so much fun. And I, what, I wanna go back to something you said earlier, which was kind of the third tier of the, of the three. And I think it's really interesting because I mean, I've spent most of my career in the startup ecosystem and I love being a builder of things, but I also think what's, what's shifting and we recently heard Forrester say this is that innovation comes from your people. And what they meant by that is there's now innovation happening at every tier in an organization, no matter how small or large. And so it doesn't only have to be the startups that are innovating and thinking about changing the way things are done or challenging status quo. And what I absolutely love about that as an innovator myself and as someone who's building technology to hopefully unblock people who are super talented inside these organizations that now can take technology that exists from the startup ecosystem and bring their real ideas to life and challenge the status quo and then rally around that and bring others along with them. So anyone can be a champion, whether you're new and young in your career career and just starting off, or if you're a C-suite executive that wants to really implement change in your organization, I think that's just, that ins inspiration does come from community and seeing it over and over. And it feels like that's a lot of at the heart of what you do as well. Absolutely. And then building on what you just said, what I find that's, this was a need that came up in the last year that our team is also filling, which is, you know, the old school mentor connections that happen inside a company, like, oh, I have a mentor. But what do you do with that mentor is the question. And so what we're finding is um, some teams want to use the liftoff framework to build connections with their mentees and executives. And they're actually challenging each other on, well, I, I see it this way. This might be interesting. And some of the rising team, rising team members are like, well, that worked 10 years ago, but this is actually, right? So, and they're pushing back and they're, what they're doing is they're actually working on innovation together. And it isn't in theory, it is in reality because ultimately at the end, they're gonna sign a deal with one of these companies to try this thing in real time. So it, to me, it kind of brings mentorship to a whole new level and makes it very accessible and, and real. And you start really doing business yeah. with a colleague who happens to be more senior or, or junior than you. So you, you talked about um, accelerators a little bit and how they're different in other parts of the world. For our listeners that might not really know a lot about accelerators and how they work and might be very early stage, can you give an example of like what a company should, should expect when they get involved in an accelerator? Like what's the before and after look like? Sure. 
So every accelerator is different. People always call me and they'll say, I got into X accelerator, should I do it? And then I have a series of questions that I ask. Um, our two accelerators are run, um, the sports tech accelerator is run in partnership with Boomtown and these great 10 partners, big brand partners um, that roll up their sleeves and give you like real access to try things with WrestleMania as an example. Um, that's an accelerator that if you get into, it's like, yes, of course I would do that. Our um, Lift Labs Accelerator focused on media entertainment connectivity is in partnership with Techstars and it is rated one of the best of all of Techstars programs. And a lot of that has to do with the equal skin in the game that we bring to the table. So we have 250 plus mentors that are part of it. 70% of our companies land pilot proof of concept that lead, lead into an actual business deal at the end. So people are using it for real business development, learning and growth, but real mm -hmm. business development. Um, so an accelerator, if you don't know, listener, <laughs> uh, what that is, is it's basically a 12-ish week um, intense time to work on your business and be questioned on absolutely every part of it. And for us, we work with, I'd say, later, uh, later pre-seed companies. So there's already a product, there is some traction, and there's already interest in somebody from our company who thinks that there's a there there. There are other accelerators that you can get into that I'd say are a little bit more on the incubation side, more around maybe you had an idea, you want to give it a go. Um, you certainly get a lot of you know good resources, and you know, but the difference there is maybe you're not going to try to launch it during the program and try to, to eventually scale it with with a partner. Um, the you know, the things that you learn in an accelerator, everything from building your team to building your business case in a way, um, your sales sheets, your product demo videos, um, and a lot of that stuff, our team develops with the companies in our programs. Mm -hmm. Every one of our companies walks away with basically their advertisement for what their product offers. We do a lot of PR around the companies, uh, very different than some other accelerators, but obviously given our, the start of our conversation on marketing and communications and branding, <laughs> we take that, we know that that's important to the start of a company. Um, team development is something that we spend a lot of time on personally. I'm you know, always encouraging people to even at the very beginning, think about creating the rubric for you know, diversity hiring. Even if you're hiring one person or two people, like start at the very beginning to do that. Right. Yeah, um, and then part of your like value system that you build exactly. day exactly. one. Yeah. yeah, start building that at the beginning. Um, challenging on product and technology, right? Like it's really about what differentiates your technology mm -hmm. and grow and, and gets you traction. So we're all about in the accelerator getting, uh, helping you get it, get traction and watching you succeed getting traction. And those, even when you apply to an accelerator, our applications are actually due um, in mid-May, and we'll get a, a ping from maybe a founder today, which we're talking about this in mid-April, um, that'll tell us, oh, they're at, they're at you know X ARR or something like that. And then when they follow up with us, they're at 10 X ARR or whatever it was they said, we're like, oh, wow, even in that short period of time, you've shown that much success, that much growth, that much traction, um, that's incredible. And the things we really look for in all in, you know, any of our accelerators, one is the, the people, the team, the leaders, what have they done before? Have they built another successful company? Who were they referred to us by? Was, was that a successful company? And we push on the network a lot because again, going back to what I said earlier, we scout from an incredibly inclusive network. Um, so we, we also want to make sure we're not just getting referrals from who we know, right? Like, we want to extend that network as much as possible. Um, so we look at the team, we look at the traction, you know, what was that growth? 
And then really the, the TAM, which is like, what is the true, you know, addressable market here? And what uh, specifically on the accelerators, a lot of times they're looking at it from an investment perspective. That, right. you know, is this, is this a VC backable, scalable company? I will say, however, that not every company that goes through our programs ends up wanting to raise money. Many of them end up just wanting to keep bootstrapping. They don't need to raise money. Um, so that is not necessarily like the, I think the, the, the films make, that you're yeah, really pop helpful. culture make us think that that's what matters, but it's really about like, are you making money? And yeah, you can make money without ever raising money. And <laughs> you can make money just by having an amazing customer base and growing your customer base, which I think is really impressive. And then, then you'll start seeing people making you offers on funding. So yeah, absolutely. So I, yeah. my, my accelerator um, kind of exposure was before I spun content stack out of the previous company and I had bootstrapped for 11 years before having the accelerator conversations. And, yeah. um, and one of the big outcomes was just digging deep into my business model and helping me decide whether or not to do the restructure and the spinoff. And it ended up helping me think through a lot of the difficult um, challenges of doing that. And then we ended up spinning off content stack and raising a lot of money for it and selling another company that we spun off. And we still have our digital sports, uh, you know, business at Raw Engineering. So it's pretty interesting um, how, you know, accelerators can take you in one direction or the other and poke holes into your business model, help you prepare for your next step and next stage. So um, and cool. you do have to be careful of listening to, well, there's two things to be careful of an accelerator. One is um, getting too many opinions and then you're totally confused <laughs> on what you're doing. And then the second one is what we call happy ears, where the founders are only hearing the good things and they don't fix the things that people keep telling them need to get fixed on the product, on the positioning, on the you know business model, whatever it is. So those are the two things to, to what's look out for. What's interesting, Danielle, about that is I think that's true in and out of an accelerator. Like just as a founder, you, as a you get a lot of advice <laughs> as a human too. But as a, yeah, as an entrepreneur, as a founder, you get a lot of advice, yeah. um, sometimes solicited and sometimes not. And you have to yes. um, trust your gut a little bit along the way as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I, I love what you said about creating a symphony of innovation. That just sounds really awesome at Comcast. Um, but a lot of times innovation centers become a wheel with no spokes. What, what types of tips do you have to infuse innovation into an organization? It becomes like a part of the mindset of a company. Yeah. I think, you know, so much of it is giving people the tools to feel like it's okay and accessible to innovate. Right. You know, like the, in my opinion, when you have just an innovation team versus an innovation company, it, it is, it's just so important that everyone's thinking about it. And it doesn't, what, I, what it doesn't mean is there could be huge cores of your business that never change, mm -hmm. right? But whoever's running those businesses should be looking around the corner, challenging the status quo, finding ways to make things less expensive, maybe look for new revenue streams. Don't just rest on, you know, what you have now. And um, so I think it's, it's in everyone, right? Not everyone does that naturally, but when you offer tools, like in our case, when we have the liftoff challenges, we bring together executives from across various parts of the company to, to develop what's the call for startups challenge. And then when we have a demo day with five companies that we've narrowed down to and it's in a specific vertical, we invite other people who maybe weren't part of the screening process. And then we're always, I don't even wanna say pleasantly surprised because we kind of knew it was gonna happen <laughs> that five more people said, oh, I'm interested in that company because they might be able to solve this challenge in this way for my use case at parks or at, you know, the Xfinity team or at pictures. And so it just, it is so much about communication. Again, it goes back to communication and awareness and transparency. And 
um, getting, getting people kind of out of their comfort zone, showing them how other teams are doing this work. And then it becomes quick aha moments, of course. Mm -hmm. And it's very exciting because I, I, again, I don't, I think I mentioned when I was describing the three goals we have, I didn't realize how important that, that was when we built Lift Labs. You know, we, when, when the press release went out, it said that we were, a, a pro, we're building a program for startups to work with Comcast NBCU. And I think it was real, it's really for startups and our employees, our teams to work side by side with each other to innovate. And yeah. that's just been really exciting to watch. It's the it, icing on the cake. It's that, that collaboration that creates um, more business leadership, really, because you're, you're cultivating, Absolutely. taking risks, you're making it not scary to do that and encouraging it. And that's also helping people to become better at what they do and giving an opportunity to do significant work that's meaningful to, to the companies and the and the teams that they work with, which is really cool. Yeah. And, you know, for, I, I think for me personally, and I don't know if this is for you, but when hiring people, all the questions I ask them have to do with collaboration. Mm -hmm. You know, do you, it's not just getting along with others, but do you really collaborate with other people and other teams? You know, when you think about how resources can be maximized, leveraged, talent, you know, when you think about talent, who want to stay with a company for a long time. It's because someone said to you, I see your potential and you're doing this now, keep doing that, but you're also going to do this. I'm going to lift you to the next level because I see your potential and you'd be a great collaborator on this other thing. And can, we can use you on this. And so to me, that's, that's the fun of all of this work. It's that okay. It comes back to the unity. Like mixing pot, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's that it's that feeling that sense of significance and like being yes. a part of something, right? And that's that all comes back to where we started, which was building community, whether it's inside the startup ecosystem in your community in Philadelphia or within your organization, which is really cool. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm gonna end on our four questions that we ask at the end of each episode. Okay. Um, and the first one is what is your wake-up song? Generally anything by Prince, but I'm going to go with let's go crazy. <laughs> Perfect. Um, if 19 year old Danielle came to you and said, what should I read? What should I listen to? What would you tell her? So it's really hard to narrow this down to one thing, but I think I'm going to go with how I built this by Guy Raz, the podcast. Awesome. I love that one. Can you recommend your favorite beverage? So uh, it's called the log splitter, but for me, it's not really about beverage. It's always about the setting, who you're with, showing up, mm -hmm. um, basically anything that's got any, any beverage with a Baja Beach Club vibe is my style. <laughs> I love it. That's, um, it's interesting because experiences are really, like wine is only interesting to me because of the experiences they present. And I think you just described that perfectly well. What, what should our listeners do tomorrow to help them become dream makers? So each year I write down a list of goals for the year on a card. It's usually a five by seven card and I mail it to myself and I open it a year later. These are really big dreams that I have. And some are small things about, you know, health or wellness or trips I want to take or whatever. It is amazing that every year I pretty much accomplish what's on that card big and small writing it down. Um, yeah. So, and then I've had my team do the same thing and mail it and then open it up and celebrate those successes at the end. They're big rocks for the year. Um, so that's one thing. And you know, the other thing I'm always, <laughs> I always have to talk about is if you see something wrong, like legitimately wrong, I think especially in this world we live in, in, in diversity and equity and inclusion, do not sit back and wait for somebody else to fix something. Fix it yourself. Raise your hand. Um, pull others into that conversation. And um, I think sometimes it takes years of experience of doing that to feel comfortable doing it. But the more you do it, the more the other people on your team see you doing it, and then they'll do it more and they become very real, authentic conversations and 
you're solving something big and bigger than yourself. So to me, it's like amazing how great ideas, you know, are, are made for whether it's businesses or how other voices are heard at the table, um, just by speaking up. And I feel extremely privileged that I have a voice that you even, you know, invited me here today. And the idea that I, I do speak for other people, I, I know I do. Like, I know that I pers- my one voice can make such a difference in a team of 10 and a spill up and a, and a trickle out of those 10 people and how important that is. Thank you, Danielle. I love it. Show up and speak up. And those are really great words of advice. Thank you again for being on Dream Makers. This was really fun. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun.